are here with the B&H virtual event space. We got Scott Robert Lim is back. And Scott, what are we, what are we talking about today? Well, we got some exciting stuff today. We're, I'm going to take you around the world in the comforts of your own home, and I'm going to show you how I do my portraiture all around the world in heavily populated tourist areas and how I get my shot with the most minimal equipment. Awesome. So this is this perfect. This is going to be great for anyone who travels. And as always with travel photography, it's like I think people put travel photography in this bubble that you can only do it when you travel. Everything that applies to travel photography applies <laughs> to doing it anywhere. You can do it in your living room. It's, it's exactly. really just it's comprehensive lighting. It's working with what you have to get the most beautiful shot. Okay. Well, my travel is shooting in Central Park, but that's not traveling for you. <laughs> exactly. Although I've seen the images you're about to show us, and that looks nothing like my travel, which is like down to the corner to get a bag of chips. So Scott is going to be taking us, like he said, on a trip all around the world. So that all being said, Scott, let's take this trip around the world. Let's do it. Now, I love questions because then I know I'm tracking with you all. So if, uh, you know, I'm not, if you don't, I don't hear any questions, I'm not sure if I'm hitting the mark with you guys or you either love what I'm doing or hate what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> we'll but let anyways, you know either way. <laughs> it's all good. Um, can you see my whole screen there? Is that cool? Like yeah. if I do a full length shot, Okay, well, we'll figure it out. Let me see. Yeah. No, All right, so I'm taking you to Cuba. How's that? How about if Wonderful. I tell you some little stories about it, too? Let's see. So we, were, we had this shot in mind, planned in our brain. We knew exactly where we wanted to shoot it what we wanted to do. We had the ballerina all set up. The only thing was we couldn't find a car. So we're literally hours before the shoot, and we had like 20 people like waiting, you know, that our students were ready to go with this shoot and we couldn't find a car and we finally convinced this guy to do it. And uh, I feel a little bit bad because after the shoot, you could see these little indentations uh, on his uh, car. We did give him 150 bucks, which is huge there because, uh, you know, the average, you know, somebody makes three to five dollars a day there. So, uh, you know, that was a month's worth of pay. So hopefully. Uh, I used, to, anyways, work, I used that to work in a, a body shop. So that's like, ah, uh, it's like the, the old me is cringing at those, getting those hood dents out. I, I know, I know, I know. But I anything know. for the show. Body shop. Uh, but so anyways, let's look at the setup. I really literally set this up in literally probably less than a minute. Um, so what you want to do is when you're shooting a portrait, um, you want the subject to feel comfortable and not squinting. And so if I can find large areas of shade, that's a great thing. Now, the only problem is, is if your subject's in shade, then your background could be very, very bright. So you might have a mismatch of lighting. So that's why you have to bring in some light to match the background uh, exposure. Okay, so that way you can see, because the sun is shining very bright on that sky behind her. And so I have to match that exposure, that light quantity that's showing on the clouds, I have to match that light quantity on the subject. And because the sun is very, very strong, you need a very, very strong light source. And so I kind of had the pose in my mind and everything. And so I, had, I wanted this look. And if you look at the photo, uh, before here, um, you can see the highlight and shadow, right? So you see some highlight and shadow, highlight and shadow, highlight and shadow. That's what creates interesting lighting for me. So lighting for me is not necessarily getting the right exposure on your subject. Lighting for me is creating a shadow because why do we want shadows? shadows create depth in the photo. Without a shadow, you won't be able to see any kind of shape or texture. So it's the shadow that really brings the subject out because it contours and cuts their body and shape. Um, so that's why it's very important. 
Okay, so that's the setup there, and uh, I did that. Any questions on that? Nobody? Well, going forward, um, I think it would be interesting to talk about whether you use glass strobes, continuous all okay, the time. Okay, yes. So what I'm going to do is I'm these first few photos, I want to keep you interested. So I don't want to just give you some technical stuff right in the beginning. I want to show you what I do. I'm going to show you three different situations, kind of like what I use for flash, what I use for continuous natural light, and what I use for continuous light. And so then we can kind of break down when I choose to use each. How's that? So this Sounds one great. is kind of like a bright light shot, right? It is literally 100 degrees out there and just like we're sweating up a storm. Um, and, it, and so this is kind of like the bright light shot. And I have to use flash here, very strong flash to do that. Okay, here is natural light. And this natural light, is great when the sun is low and the reason why that is is that when the sun is low you can get this multi lighting effect that happens with the low sun because the sun is low and not really shining on the ground that creates an awesome catch light in somebody's eye so if I put the sun behind my subject when the sun is low, look at, do you see that little, that rim light around them? I love that. That's created by the sun. But you can see a catch light in the eye. So how is, and so for me, catch lights are everything. If I don't have a catch light, I don't even take the portrait. So every portrait pretty much I take has to have a catch light or else it's not a portrait for me. So what creates this? catch light right there right let's see if it'll zoom in and if i zoom in hopefully it'll well maybe it doesn't <laughs> my internet is slow uh, i have another slide that kind of demonstrates this so let me go okay there it is what is that catch light that catch light is the sky that the sun is shining on but if my ground was bright if the sun was shining on the ground you wouldn't have any catch light at all right so in order for you to have a catch light you have to have a, a contrast of lighting your subject has to be in an area where it's dark but they are looking in a brighter light source and because the sun is low it's not shining on the ground it's shining in the sky above them, creating a natural catch light. And so therefore, when you use low sun, you get this duality of light that just naturally occurs, especially if you have open skies above you. And so that's one of, why it's one of the best times to shoot is all you got to do is get that sun low, get that light behind them to give you that beautiful rim light, and then if you have open blue sky in front of them, you're gonna get the amazing catch light. Is that cool? I love doing that technique. So that's a natural light technique and you can see the catch light there. As the sun gets lower, the more shade it creates on the ground, but it still lights the sky for a long skinny catch light and it's great rim light. So you can get two light sources at once with very low sunset shots. Okay. Oh, well, here we go. New York. This is travel for me, but that's not travel for <laughs> a lot of you guys. And um, I just love this shot because we're doing this session. Okay. If you don't know this, there's like 10 of us, like literally five feet back, all crammed up. Everybody's trying to take a picture. I mean, we got body sweat all over us. Who knows? I probably caught the coronavirus at that time, but, <laughs> but here we are trying to rip off a shot. And I don't have the best lighting. I don't have a catch light in their eye. So what do I do? I have my little constant video light. I shine it not directly at them. I want to create soft light. So I shine it up towards the uh, roof of the uh, subway car. So it will kind of reflect down and give me a soft light and kind of fade the light off them. So, uh, you know, lighting is all about the positioning of the light, and that's an art form in itself. And so just getting the exposure, I mean, I could have just put my video light up, 
turned it on really low and lit them. And that would have been fine. I would have got a good exposure. But to me, it's more than it's exposure. It's about how that light lays on them. Does it look soft? Does it look natural? So my whole thing with my lighting is I want a person to guess a lot of times. Is that natural light? Was it there? Or did he use a flash? Or did he use video light? What kind of softbox? I want, I want it to look so natural, you don't even know what type of lighting that I used. And so this is one of those cases where it seems like it was easy. Oh, Scott, just put your video light. But I had to spend a few, well, plus it, you're moving around and everything, right? It's tough. Uh, I had to get, spend a few minute, minutes of positioning that light right to create that softness there. And then you gotta pose them and all that kind of stuff too. Uh, but this is a case where I'm using constant light in somewhere like a subway or indoors, you could definitely use constant light. Any questions? Moving on. Okay, here's another low light situation where we had uh, the those kind of uh you know those fairy lights right so they wrap that around the edge of the umbrella to get light there and then there's also a video light inside the boat to give you some up light and so um that's how this was created uh there was enough and then oh actually there's another light shining here across the lake to open this area up okay and guess what these stars are fake <laughs> It wasn't, I mean, it was not, obviously the stars didn't look that great. <laughs> so I had to add that. But um, this is handheld, okay? I didn't use a tripod at all. I just handheld it. I probably shot it at about a tenth of a second and took a, a whole bunch of shots to make sure that I had one that was sharp. Uh, and But it was definitely just handheld. That's um, got very low level. We had a question yes. come in on, on retouching um, for the subway picture yeah. in, in particular. Uh, oh, okay. How much, so we, you said it was a video light. Um, so just, yeah. a, I'm guessing just a regular LED panel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then how much retouching do you normally, especially on this the subway shot in particular? Yeah, no, this wasn't much at all because it was just about smoothing the skin and then kind of creating a color balance that I wanted. That's about it. So on this, when, okay, here's the thing. When you get the lighting right, no matter if you make it color, black and white, I don't care what you do with it, typically if you get the lighting right, everything looks good. That's a sign that you're doing a good job with your lighting because whatever magic preset you do or whatever, dang, that looks good, I can't decide. They all look good, should I do it this, should I do it that? that's a good sign that you're light. But when you don't have the lighting and you're trying to work it and Photoshop and this, that's what I call polishing a turd. You're spending hours and hours to make a turd look good and then it comes to the end and you go, you know what, this just ain't working out. Or you're trying to make it work and you still feel like, you know, this still looks terrible. <laughs> After four hours later, right? Been there, who's been there and done that, right? But that's just part of the process of you developing your signature style with your post-processing. Does that answer your question? Good. I think that's good, yeah. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the lighting situation. There's basically three lighting situations that you're going to encounter. Okay, and I kind of break this up in the Sunny 16 rule. I'm not going to go through all this, but the Sunny 16 rule is somebody was very smart. Somebody said, let's measure the brightest when the sun's out, right? Because relatively, right, the sun does not change its distance from the earth. So it's very far away. So if we measure on a clear day when the sun's out, it's brightest point, you're going to put your camera on F16 and match your shutter speed with your ISO, and that will give you a, a good exposure without even looking at your guide uh, a meter or anything. That's generally the strongest strength of the sun. Okay? Now, you don't, so when we talk, when a photographer talks, oh yeah, I, that was F16, or uh, that was F56. He's generally referring to the strength of light that's needed to take that picture. Not that you have to shoot at that f-stop, 
okay? So when old timers like, oh, well, that's F11, no, that's F6, or that's F4, they're referring to the light strength, okay? So just remember, so like, let's do equivalent exposure. So F16, like in the super bright sun, and how do you know you're in super bright sun? You see sharp shadows on the ground, okay? You see sharp shadows on the ground? Okay, we're at F16 here. So if you do F16, ISO 100, shutter 100, you get that exposure for that. But if you shoot at F2, the equivalent exposure is 1 hundredth of a second. That's the same light value. So when you're going out and shooting at 1.8 or 1.4 and you're pegged at 1 thousandths of a second, you're at F16. Just want to let you know, okay? And so then each of these numbers, these F stops, is one half the light. So F16, one half the light of F16 is F11. What does that look like? Well, there's still shadows on the ground, but the edges of those shadows start to become a little softer. Now, why would you get an F11? Well, maybe the sun is partially covered by something, some, some clouds or something like that, and makes it a bit softer. And then um, one half the light value from that is F8, and that's when you see overcast or very, very, very slight shadows on the ground. Then half of that light is at 5.6. What's that? That's when you're in the shade, but your eyes see some bright, uh, don't mind my daughter walking by, <laughs> with some bright um, light, like sunny skies, right? And that's what they call open shade. Uh, but that's when the sky is bright. Then dark shade to me is like you're in shade, but then maybe the clouds or the sun is kind of covered by clouds and it's a bit darker or it's a bit later in the day where the, the sky is not as bright. Then you're going to 2.8. Half that light is where you're starting to be at twilight now where maybe that sun just starts to peek down below that horizon. And then when you're at F2 or below, that's when the sun goes right down below the horizon. But um, here's the three, the, the three lighting situations you're gonna be under. So to understand lighting and to know what to use, you have to understand these three lighting situations that you're in and use the appropriate lighting for each situation. So if you're in F16 or F11, which is strong, bright, harsh shadows, this is the most difficult to shoot in because if you don't have that nose towards the light or you're in a situation where the sun is high and creating those really, really dark shadows in the eyes, which they call raccoon eyes, you need a real strong light source to get into those eyes to, to to get it out, right? Because you have to match the strength of the sun, basically. And so that, that's very difficult to shoot in. That's why you need to buy a lot of lighting gear at B&H to make sure that you can get that out. <laughs> okay, then you're in this flat, boring light where there's no shadows. And actually, so remember that Cuba picture that I took? I was in the shade. And so that was boring light. So I had to give her some highlight and shadow. So that's why I had to bring in my own light to create those shadows. And so when I'm in this boring light, I bring in my own light to give me a highlight and shadow. The subject's comfortable because they're in the shade, they're not squinting. And then I just bring in my light to create that highlight and shadow. And hopefully that matches that background if we were in a sunny day or have beautiful clouds. If you're an overcast, I literally just change the sky at that point. Uh, because I'm putting highlight and shadow on my subject and so therefore, I can put highlight and shadow in my, in my clouds, in my sun, and it looks believable, okay? So that's typically what I do on an overcast weather. And then, here's the key. When that sun goes below the horizon, you definitely, everybody should go to straight video light for the most part. Because pretty much any video light, probably over 2,000 um, lumens would be good. Uh, and would work. But you need about 2,000 or over because it has to, for me, I like to shine it through an umbrella and an umbrella takes away uh, two stops of light or one quarter of the light. Uh, three quarters of the light is taken away by the umbrella. 
So that's why you need a fairly strong source to push through that umbrella, uh, especially if you had it about three feet away from your subject or farther, you're gonna need at least 2000 lumens. Now, I use the Stella Pro lights. They're actually 8,000 and 10,000 lumens. So I can actually use them in this area here. And those are really great. And it's, that's a constant light. But typically, uh, you're probably going to use flash here, here. If you have a strong video light, you can get away with it here. Uh, and then here, definitely constant light. Okay. Any questions on that technical stuff? I don't want to go too long on it. This is a chart that I have that tells you whatever f-stop, this is how I became world famous actually, <laughs> this little chart here that I created, thousands of people have it, you can screen capture it or whatever, but whatever f-stop you are in ISO, I tell you the flash, a basic flash, what flat, uh, flash power you should have it on at about five and a half to six feet away, and you'll get the perfect exposure. And so you notice down here, there's, it doesn't really, when you're having your flash shoot at 164th power and 128th power, the light is very, very inconsistent. Why is that? Well, a flash is so powerful to throttle that power down and control it as hard. And this is my analogy. If you guys watch basketball, do you, you, do you ever watch these big, heavy guys like Shaquille O'Neal O'Neal, or these big, huge guys try to shoot a free throw? Usually they're not very good. Why? They're so freaking strong that for them to have a finesse shot and make three pointers and have touch on their, on their shot is really, really hard because they're just a big, strong dude. That's what your flash is. Your flash is like a big, strong, I'm Shaquille O'Neal, man, uh, and I'm big, strong. And then when you throttle it down, it's really hard to get a consistent light on these lower areas here. So that's when you go to video light. That's why this area here is great for video light. Okay, make sense? All right, let's get to China now. So this is a, a photo that, I, uh, that was kind of widely published uh, and won some several awards on this photo. But I like this photo because it was literally just my workshop students in China. And we had been shooting all week. This was our last night. And we literally start. And so some of the students says, you know, Sky, you've been shooting these models and everything. We're getting dressed up and you're shooting us. I'm like, oh, okay, so we're in Beijing, right? And it takes them forever to get ready. So we literally don't start shooting till about 10 o'clock at night, right? And then in the, in the hotel room, it had this really cool wallpaper. And so we kind of had this idea of them getting ready. And so I took about three or four flashes and I laid them on the back of this wall and I just fired all this backlight so it would bounce against the wall up on the ceiling and come down and just give them a big wall of soft light on them. But I used like four really basic, you know, $100 or less flashes uh, to light up that wall. But to soften it, I ricocheted off that wall and on the ceiling to give me that soft light. And so that's how I did that. Okay, so let's move on. Um, we're gonna go to the Mojave Desert now. And um, this is a shot during sunset. Um, and I did this, even though the sun was low, it was still very, very, very strong. I was in the desert, so I think this was still F-16 or F-11. And so to actually, if you want to shoot in bright light, one of the best things that you can do if you don't have a lot of money is just to put two basic flashes together and that should give you enough power. Uh, here's my setup shot for that. So you can see, I don't have very much of anything. I just have a flash, two flashes through a very basic shoot through umbrella to give me that soft light. And so what you want to do is try to get that light as close as possible to your subject and through a diffuser to give you really soft light. And that's really what makes a portrait sing 
is your ability to create soft light. And when you can use soft light in a hard light situation, that's when your stuff's gonna look really, really professional. And so and to, in order to do that, really, all you gotta do is kind of put two flashes together and that should give you enough strength to do most of your stuff. And so if I had to, if you just gave me two flashes, an umbrella and a decent video light, I can do pretty much anything. And so I've learned to just work within those parameters. Scott, we had a question come in on this one, uh, asking about yeah. the background. If you blurred the background in post or what aperture are you were yes. shooting at here? So look at my background. Does that look interesting to you? No, <laughs> it's just a sunset, right? And so basically I just added a sky in there to give me a little bit more interest. And you can see the highlight and shadow here right and because i have highlight and shadow on my subject it, it's a believable now i don't go crazy with sky the, the one technique that i do with sky replacement is i don't go crazy and and make it like super fabulous because then it can kind of look fake so i subtly do it so that's why i get this question did you add a sky or did it was it like that or did you so, shoot it did you shoot it wider open or did you add a little blur to the background you know what Let's find, oh yeah, I, I, sh I blurred the background out for sure. Cause I think I had it, let's see what we can see here. Okay, here we go. Oh, well actually it says 1.8 I shot it at. So it was at 1.8, but I still blurred it some more because of the distance of, cause I'm shooting with an 85 millimeter lens here. So to get a full length shot, oh shoot, sorry, <laughs> I wanted to, collapse this so uh how do i take this to no not show more uh you know what i don't see my whole screen here so i'm trying to take that away that info do you see anywhere there okay so <laughs> um i'm shooting wide angle with an 85 you know how far back you have to be in order for you to capture that action and how she's spreading her arms and everything and because i'm farther back even though i'm this is probably should be one of my next lectures here b and h about the about the dof triangle so your depth of field is based on not only your f stop but your distance and the length of your lens at your subject and because i'm so far away it made that background sharper even though i'm shooting at 1.8 okay so that's why I had to blur it out, right? So, you know, it's a combination of the lighting, of, your, of the posing and the post-processing. It all kind of works together. So you can't just go, I'm going to master my lighting and that's it. You, it all has to come together uh, to create shots, okay? So here, let's go to Paris now. Again, I am in overcast. This is the best time to shoot in Paris when it's raining. Okay, because everybody clears out. <laughs> okay, so here we are. Okay, the workshop, it's raining, it's overcast. I need, even though it's overcast, you're still at F8. So that light is bright. And a lot of times it's coming from above and it's creating those shadows in the eyes. You see that? You can still see the raccoon eyes in my subject there. So I had to use a little bit of flash and make sure she's looking up towards that light to get that light into her eyes here so I don't see those shadows. Even at a, if I'm at F8 and it's overcast, you're still gonna get shadows there. And so that's why I use a flash right there to what? create that highlight and shadow, and then I could go in and subtly create some clouds in the background. I could even do something a little bit more drastic if I wanted to, and it would still look okay. I could make it look like it's sunset or something like that because I have a highlight and shadow on my subject. Okay, so again, shooting in overcast, adding my light, and then being able to change my sky from that. Okay, now, uh, let's go to Hawaii. You guys like Hawaii? So we're doing this workshop with Sony and I have this idea of using constant light and do this free fall type of thing. Okay, now I want you to look. Again, I'm really in overcast lighting here. And so 
there was these shadows that were in her eye. And so I just needed a little video light there to give me some highlight and shadow on her. Now this is with a Stella 1000. So this gives me a burst of 2000, uh, 2500 lumens for 45 seconds. And so I had that burst on and I just stuck my camera on like, you know, 10 frames per second to give me that free falling shot. And then because I kind of had that highlight and shadow, I could go in and what? Change my sky to giving me some oomph in that photo. Okay, so that's the setup shot. You guys know Stan Moniz? Uh, yes. Also Sony. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's, that's him right there. <laughs> ah, okay. All right, now, this is a shot. This is, st I started to realize the power of video light. And this is when it started to be, you know, you started to be able to get these LED panels for really at inexpensively at this time. And so they just started to break. And then instead of using a flash, I started experimenting using um, video light at night when the sun went down. And so this was, I'm so proud of this shot because it literally took me about 30 seconds to set this shot up. And what do you do? You set your background first. Now, this little structure here, I don't know if you've been to Paris, but there's no light on this structure. Okay, so it's in complete darkness at nighttime. So what I did was I set my background first, whatever that was. Let's take a look. This is why I love this because I can actually, when somebody says, what's your camera settings? No problem. Click a button, then there it is, okay? So I'm at 1 20th of a second at 5.6. Um, I think on this lens, I could only go down to F4 on it because uh, it was an, literally an A7. You know how old A7s are? <laughs> so I shot this in 2014. Okay, this is a little while ago. This is six, wow, this is six years ago. Okay, that feels like <laughs> yesterday. ISO 3200, folks. Okay, but uh, I was able to use my, oh, sorry, video light. I keep doing that. I keep on wanting to close this. I got to close that out there. Okay, video light, set the background first, and then add video light. I had to, again, fade off the light. I was using the edge of the light, not the full strength of it, um, to make it softer. Okay, so here is in Cuba. And in Cuba, I love taking shots of street, on the streets, and just getting to know the people. And this dude won, so I think I gave him a dollar or whatever. He was so interesting. It's like, okay, I get a picture of you. And so I'm, when you're shooting on the streets, you got to use natural light. And you have to notice. But then you see the catch lights in his eyes. What was actually happening here? I was getting, and so you can see the highlight and shadow kind of here, right? But then you see a light source over here. And so really... To break this picture down is when you're in a narrow street and the sun is not directly shining on that street, that street creates two side lights for you. I had light here and light here. So what's my situation? Here's the street. Buildings here, buildings here. I positioned him. I wanted him behind this back background here. So I sat him on the curve over here. That light is coming in from two directions. Now, it's not bright light from the sun because the sun is somewhere off somewhere else. So you're getting this diffused light that's coming through the streets. And because the buildings are really high, it's blocking all that light. And so it's just letting in those side lights there, creating two side lights doing a street portrait. You guys have to master, before you even get into flash and all that, you guys really need to master natural light and see how it looks. So you know how to imitate the real world and make things look natural. And I find, well, maybe not you guys listening and tuning in because you guys are all amazing. I'm talking about the other people who are not tuning in right now. They go straight to uh, flash first because maybe they see it on Instagram or something like that without really understanding natural light first and I think the progression is natural light constant light then flash and if you kind of take it in those progressions you're going to really get better at your lighting 
Okay. Also, I'm, let's stay in Cuba, okay? I love the shot. Do you see catch lights in their eyes, right? Look at, they all have beautiful lighting here and they're dark skin. I mean, if you got dark skin and you got great lighting, you got an amazing shot, okay? The formula is awesome. So get excited. You got a dark skin subject and you got amazing lighting. You better take the shot because what happens is that dark skin allows you to see the highlight and shadow, right? It's allowing you to paint that light better and the way it just falls on their skin is amazing. So the darker the skin, the more highlight and shadow you're gonna see across their body. And look at the tone right there, right? That's just beautiful. Like that highlight and shadow coming in and those eyes, right? You're gonna see what created that catch light. So every time you look at your pictures and you see a catch light, you should understand what created it. And so here was the situation. Let me pull back and let me show you the situation. My subjects were here and I was shooting this way. This is the boxing ring, okay? They were, had a overhang there. This sun was, it was really, really bright. We're talking 2, 3 p.m. in Cuba when it's super hot and super sunny. So this light was shining down and it was hitting this concrete on the ground, bouncing up, creating, it's like a huge reflector on the ground, creating that catch light right in their eyes. So that light was perfect uh, right there. So you can see on this next picture, here's a, now I took a, a portrait of this guy. If you zoom in really close, you could, that's the catch light. You can see us there taking pictures. And that catch light was created by the ground that the sun was shining on. So there's catch lights all over the place. You can get it directly from the sun. You can get it from reflected light on the ground. And so when people talk about, for some reason, there's this period of time when people were saying, oh, don't use up light on a reflector. It looks terrible. I'm like, come on, guys. You must not be that experienced because I use up light all the time. I'm in my work, right? It's like, yes, it's okay to put the reflector under your subject. You know, for some reason, there was this point where if you did that, oh my gosh, it's a sin or something like that, right? And then the eye lighter came out. And I was like, what's that? That's up light. But anyways, I rant, okay? The point is, know your catch lights. Understand them. Find them in your real world. Be a master at that, right? Let it be a challenge. Okay, this light was taken in Paris. And you know what? I love these shots of not the models that we bring, but of the students, okay? <laughs> so this is a little bit devious, okay? I'm, I'm, I would, sometimes I try to be a matchmaker. Sometimes it works out. Sometimes it doesn't. So, you know, we got these two students, and they seem to be a little bit flirting with each other or whatever. <laughs> So it's like, hey, let me take a picture of you. I got this idea in my head. I want to do this, you know, low key shot. And what I realized on this particular shot was it's not about the strength of light because we all have cameras now that can do ISO 1 million. We don't even need that much light to take a shot, but it's about the quality of light and learning to understand, even though this was literally in a dark hallway, but there was just a little bit of light coming. It was bouncing all over the place and coming inside, giving them, see the highlight and shadow, right? Dark skin. Uh, just giving me this beautiful light on my subjects. And I just had another little video constant light shining to give me this rim light to separate them. And that's all I did. But the lesson learned from this shot taken a long time. I mean, we're talking over 10 years ago, I took this shot. Okay. Um, it's, it's about the quality, learning to find the quality of light and not necessarily the strength of light. And if you can find the quality of light and you even got the fantastic plastic 50 millimeter cheap lens, that's what this was taken with. A fantastic plastic 50 millimeter 1.8. I won't say the brand because I'm sponsored by another brand right now, but you might know. <laughs> <laughs> what it is uh uh and just like a fantastic plastic and you <laughs> know uh 
and I just had it in my bag because it was so light. And it's like, oh, you need a you need a fast lens once in a while. Everybody should have that 50 millimeter 1.8. Every camera brand makes a low cost version of it. Keep it in your bag. Scott, while we're while we're in Paris, we had a question come in back on the Eiffel Tower shot. If there was any masking oh, wow. done. Okay. So I wanted to know if there was any masking just in relation to shooting at high ISO, wondering if, you know, if the balance, I guess the light balance you know, was going to be off. If you mask the subject. So we had, uh, I, I think whoever asked the question is wondering, you know, you have the light in the background. It's so oh, dark. Whether yeah. you had, you know, whether you had an imbalance of light that you had to do any masking. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Things. So what I had to do is take that video light and fade it off her. So I'm just using that edge of that light. And so it looks like it's kind of channeled and, and tunneled right at her. Um, a lot of times I don't have the time to put on these little diffusers and these grids and I don't have time for that. So I just re because I'm shooting outdoors and I don't have to worry about light bouncing around in a studio. I can just fade that light off her to, so she's just lit up and not everything else. Does that and, answer the question? Yeah, yeah. And uh, two other questions real quick. Uh, on portable reflectors, do you use, do you use like a six in one or? Oh uh, yeah, well, I usually bring uh, just like a five in one. I think uh, you, they make these kinds that have handles built into, which are pretty cool. Mm -hmm. But yeah, just your standard five in one full reflector is, is fine. I use the diffuser a lot. I use the, I use everything, the silver, even just, you know, using blocking out light once in a while, I'll just use that. So I'll use everything on that reflector. Okay. And is there anything we're going to be seeing or touching upon uh, on camera flash for like the pop up flash or people that are using, you know, they're not using off camera flash? Okay, to me, that is absolute a no no. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, okay, I don't use on camera flash because it doesn't create any shadows. Right. So if you have an on camera flash and your light is coming from the center, it I mean, like it won't create any shadows for you. It will give you a great exposure. Right. But it won't give you the depth and it will not create any shadow. It will take all your shadows away. So if I do use it, I'll turn it and maybe bounce it off a wall so it comes back or up and down. So if I do use on camera flash, it's usually not direct flash. Uh, but it's, it's more bounced off the wall. I mean, uh, I could probably go find some, but, uh, shots like that, but we'll, we'll see. And for people who have the, the models where you're not putting a speed light on, where it's just literally a pop-up flash, they do make products where you can deflect. Diffuse and it. And yeah, it looks okay. But guess what? To me, that's not real lighting because you're not simulating your environment, okay? So the earth is lit by what? The sun, one huge off-camera lighting, okay? So the more that you can simulate our natural environment and using off-camera lighting, uh, the better that you're gonna be at using lighting and then, you know, off camera flash to you will be like, that's just so easy. It'll be like, it's like nothing. But I teach using like forms of off camera lighting because I want people to create highlight and shadow. Okay, so like, let's take this. Do you guys know who Jeremy Camp is? There's a big movie out. Uh, what's the movie that's out now? I still believe or something like that. Anyways, there's a movie about him that's right now. And I had a chance to shoot. Him. I literally had 30 seconds to take his portrait right before he's going on stage to do his concert. Right. And so he's backstage. My friend is, had, was like, he's like a DJ at a radio station. So he let, let me shoot it. And this was, this was actually, so I have to set this up really fast. Right. So what do I do first? How do I go about this? How do I get this shot? right? What's my thought process? I'm going to set the background first. And so to me, I like that duality of lighting of that backlight. So I set my camera so I could see this light here because that's hard to create in Photoshop. Edge lighting is really hard to create. I don't know if anybody can create that effectively in Photoshop yet. <laughs> that's the next step. 
for somebody is to be able to create this lighting. This usually, so that's hard to create. So I'm going to set my camera so I can at least see that. My subject is dark at this point, and then I'm just bringing in my flash to fill in the face. And so see this highlight and shadow? That's what I'm looking for. And so what the satisfying as like I took this over 12 years ago and what's satisfying is that his marketing company still says to this day, like that's one of the best photos he's ever taken. <laughs> and I, I took it in 30 seconds. Okay. So that's using flash. Here's another world famous shot that I did and I chanced. Yes, I didn't. I had my bear camera in my hand, right? I, if a wave could have, came yes my camera would have been just doused in history uh and so that little catch light there was really created by my off-camera flash so my, my cousin was holding that and she was like being tossed around by the waves and uh so it's a it, it looks like it's a simple shot but actually the water was moving us around so it was a little bit difficult to how to, to get the shots so i think i was there for maybe about it seemed like a long time, but probably 10 minutes or so I was there. And so, but this was a challenge because this is when I started to understand, this is my crazy stupid light days of mixing, learning how to mix the ambient light with your created light so you can get the perfect balance in, in your mind, right? And so you had to practice that. You have to practice. And so the key is setting the background first, that ambient feel that you want, right? So it's no use taking a shot and you're not being able to see Diamond Head because that's Hawaii. This, this is an iconic thing, this Diamond Head here. So I have to make sure that this is coming out in my background. My subject's a little bit dark and then just the right flash power to finesse it. Not too strong, not too light. Just enough strength so I can get a highlight and shadow here, uh, but still look natural at the same time. That takes practice, okay? You're going to have to go out and you're going to have to practice this maybe for like a year or two every single week to be able to do that. Okay, and so here's another shot where there's no sunset there. We are in complete shade. And so I just had my subject with a very, very basic flash fire it at my subjects to give me that sunset feel. And this was so, this was taken a long time ago. We're talking 2009 or something like that, over a decade ago, where I started to feel empowered. And this is that phrase that I had, sunset in your pocket. This, it originated from this picture here because I felt so empowered. I can go anywhere and make it look like there's a sunset when there isn't from this thing that you literally could just put in your pocket. And I felt so empowered to be able to do that. And I basically did it in one or two shots that I got so jazzed about being able to do that. Okay, here's another shot uh, again was that time period. This is, happens to be in China and Hong Kong, a very famous place because of these, I guess, this, uh, these kind of stair-like things and it would go on for a long ways. And during the daytime, they have these vendors trying to sell you stuff here. And so there's like hundreds of vendors here. But we were there at nighttime. There was absolutely no light at all. So I had to generate my own light with this shot so I had two flashes on the subject and then it was dark back here so I had to put somebody back here with a flash to light this all up or else you wouldn't even see where she was and so this was kind of like the beginning I always choose these shots but they might not necessarily be the greatest shots but they mean something to me because I learned something from it it was like a new beginning for me and so this was to be able to quickly put together multiple lighting and light up an entire background outdoors, hundreds of feet when there's absolutely no lighting around. And so here I just started to feel this power, like I am unstoppable with my three little Vivitar 283 flashes or whatever I had. And I could go out and create this stuff with like, you know, a hundred dollars in lighting. Um, another one where I was at a bar and this is when I'm started to get into the power of gels. And so I took two basic 
flashes again, the same flashes that I used over here. And I put red gels on it and I wanted to color because this was originally white and it didn't look too cool. And I wanted to make it look like a nightclub and I wanted some color back there. So when I lit, there's two little flashes back here with red gels on them. And I lit these walls up here in this back of this area to give me a mood that I wanted and see, see the red highlight on them, right? And I set that up and that's like, look really cool. And then I looked at my subjects and I go, they look like they're very uh, satanic because they got <laughs> their, their skin is all red. I go, I don't want that effect. Now, if I was going for that effect, that'd be cool, but I didn't want that effect. So how did I get that? red out of them and I didn't have any more flashes. So what did I, I said, you know what? I got this video light and this is when I learned how to use mixed lighting, video light and flash because it was out of necessity. I didn't have any more flashes and so I had to do with whatever I had to do, right? So I set my flashes on a very low power. So if you're using, here's a key here. If you're using video light and you're using flash, set your flash at 64th power, 164th power, because generally that's the video light and the flash match at around that strength, okay? So I set my video lights here and here with the flashes on there, with the gels on there, 164th, shining here and here, and then I took a video light and just shined it right dead center there to take the red out of their face, okay? And, and I, so this was three, a three light setup. Scott, do you use gels at all? We had a question come in. What are your thoughts on them? If you use I them like gels. Blend? Yeah, I like to use gels to create colored effects. Um, in fact, we did that at B&H. Um, and I think I had that photo near the end where I used the uh, gels on my subjects. Um, and we use the laundry basket technique with gels and things like that. A lot of the times, I'm not usually putting gels on my subject. I'm using gels in my background. So that's generally how I use gels. Okay, here's another Cuba shot. I really love this shot because we literally just went inside his house. Cuban people are the coolest people. Like, hey, can we come in and take pictures of you? Come on in. They don't care. Right? The doors is open anyways. And there's such a like community there. So cool because it's so very social, right? And so we're coming in there taking shots of the guy, right? I love the little Che in the background. And my, what's my lighting here? He had this, I was crammed up. I was literally like maybe five feet from him using my 24 millimeter prime lens to try to get this shot. So, and of course, when you're shooting street photography, you don't have time to set up lighting. You know, this guy's going to give you literally 30 seconds and get annoyed of you if you don't get your shot off. If you're struggling with your focus and your whatever, forget it. You're not going to get the shot. He's going to be so annoyed after 13, 15 seconds that if you don't get the shot by then, he's going to kick you out. All right. So what's my setup? Look at the eyes. Good thing I have a 42 megapixel camera where I can zoom in really close. You can see me right there in the middle, okay? The eyes reflect what the subject is seeing. So if you just zoom in real close, that's why you should go, if you don't have a 42 megapixel camera, go to B&H right now, put one in your cart, okay? Because then you can take a look at these eyes and see what, so what's the setup? I'm right here in the middle, right? And there was a door open and it's the sun is beating down on the floor next to the door. I think that's the door right there. And giving me the up light right here, giving me this side light. Okay, so that's a reflection. Again, up light, folks. It's up light. Yes, I use up light. Let the world know. Uh, okay, giving me that side light here. And, that's, and so whenever you're shooting a guy, you always like that split lighting where one half of their face is lit and the other fat, uh, part is in shadow, but you still get the catch lights with both the eyes there. So I think what's happening really, that light is coming in lighting here, but it's lighting the wall in front of him probably or something giving him another catch light there or whatever. I'm not quite sure what that other eye was. Now, Scott, it's not a lighting question, but we had a question come in on in Cuba when you're yeah. shooting subjects like this, as far as releases, how does it work with permission, releases, or is it pretty lax? 
super lax. They don't even have any way of contacting you at all or searching the internet or whatever. And so they just, like a lot of them never get to see pictures of themselves. Like, so you'll take the picture and then you show it to them and then you say, can I email this to you or something? And they're like, oh, I don't have an email address. And so that time, so the split second that you show the picture, that's all that they have. And they just cherish that memory. It's so sad. I mean, I think it's like, I think one time we we're going to bring some portable printers. I think the next time we're going to go there so we can at least, if we see them again, print it out or, or just print it for them right there, hand it to them because they don't have access to photos, which is, is, we take it as like, hey, common, but it's a real luxury there just to have one photo in their hand. Uh, so it's a completely different world. And, but what I try to do, you know, give them a few bucks. And so don't get worried about, so here's, here's when you go and do street photography, right? And you know, a lot of people try to go over there and like, uh, all you got to do is literally get $100 of like a $1 coin. And if you had a $100 coin and you just, every time you took a photo, whether they wanted, you know, if they let you do it for free or whatever, and you just gave them a dollar, they'd be so happy. I mean, a lot of them make $3 or less a day. So, you know, just to take it, give them a buck or five bucks or whatever, that's like huge to them. And so I just, you know, carry a lot of change in my hand. I try, now that's the hard part, trying to get change. Uh, and then just toss them out like water. Who cares if you spend $200, but you get the most amazing portraits, right? We spend $200 on what dinner? in New York, right? Like that's 200 bucks, you know? And so it's like, don't worry about it. Just have a bunch of change, give it out like water, make people happy, right? Develop relationships with people and it's fun. Here, right, so here's another uh, shot in Cuba. We hired these the ballerinas and stuff and uh, natural light again. I saw this stairway. I love the character, you know, when I just see stuff like this and the character and the tone. And um, I love it because it's kind of matching what they're wearing. And, you know, she, she was telling us that, like, they just don't get access to, to great clothing. They can't get access to it, you know, and they, they want to wear something really nice for us, but they can't even buy it, you know. And so I just, you know, I had some dresses that I had the models and I just left it for them. And they were just like, they're just like $15 dresses I found on eBay or whatever. And it meant so much to them just to have some clothing, right? And so I kind of like this and like, she's working really hard for us. And I think she's on the national ballet team. And, uh, you know, she's got this clothes and it doesn't look the most perfect and she's not in the right area. And I just sit her on the steps and she looks so beautiful just like got this expression from her and took this shot in natural light. And I'm, the next photo kind of shows the setup, right? So she's over there after I took, I can't remember if I did this first or last or whatever. So I sat her right there with this little, and here's the open doorway to give me that light in her eyes. Okay, here we are at B&H, okay? And you asked about colored gels and we were messing around. And here is the key, and I know a lot of people try to do this effect, and it looks best when you have somebody with dark skin. And I see a lot of people do this with, with lighter skin subjects, but it won't look as good because what happens is the dark pigment reflects the gel color. So if it, it's like if you have a white palette and you try to make it a color, it's a lot higher, harder if it's, the, if it's a lighter color, like a white wall, it's really hard to gel. But if you have a gray wall or a dark wall, you can gel it. And the same thing with when you're doing this technique. So what we did is that we were downstairs, you know, where that constant light area was at B&H. And we just took out these Stella lights and they had some gels there. And we just put it over the video lights and, and, and did this shot because I guess somebody wanted to try it. It's like, okay, let's do it, right? So we're just having fun messing around. So the key to this is 
when you do this type of shot, you need to learn how to create shadows because you will not get a blue here. So the color picks up where the shadow is, okay? Because if I had red and there was no shadow here, that red would be shining here. And when that blue tries to go on it, it would be overpowered by the red and you won't see a blue. So you need to create, the key to it is creating shadows and you get the two different colors, right? So if that red light's coming here, look at the R. Of course, there's gonna be a shadow there. So you shine the blue light the other way to fill in the shadow. So in order to do this effect, you need to understand how to create shadows on your subject. If you don't understand how to do that, then you gotta go to more of my workshops and then you got to <laughs> do this with the gels, right? So you need to understand how to create shadows on your subject because the other color fills in the other shadow. So the blue is the shadow, okay? Questions? We're cool. Sometimes I talk so long, so much that I don't allow people to interject and <laughs> ask a question. And no, so, you're, you're good. We're, we're a little over 3.30. We're going to keep rolling with it a little bit. Well, we're, okay, we're, yeah, just tell me no, to stop. I can we're, keep we're going. Get, we're getting some good information, so we'll let, we'll let you finish out here. Okay, so here it is. Here's the setup, right? We're using just two gels, right? Just taping them on there. And then we're creating this side and then the shadow side here, right? And then one, we tried to do a yellow gel behind there to do the rim light and just having fun experimenting. And then I did my laundry basket thing down over here. Had to go back to BNH and do that again. That was fun. We had so many people that were just walking by stopping and like so fascinated it because it was constant light. I said, Oh, just take your iPhone out and put it in portrait mode and take a shot. And they were like so excited to get a shot with their iPhone in portrait mode. Okay. Uh, here we are um, in Italy on the Spanish steps. Now, have you guys ever been to Italy on the Spanish steps? There are thousands of people at a, there at a time. And what makes this special was this was the first session and I think the only session that we said, well, we don't really want people there. Let's start this portrait session in Italy on the steps at 12 midnight. So we literally went there at 12 midnight and started our session and then like the street cleaner dudes would stop and watch us. And uh, it was so fun because, you know, we, it ended, but you could start to see the sunrise knowing that we had a good session. And uh, I think we went to eat breakfast or something later. It was really fun, but uh, sometimes, you just have to go at these weird times and get your butt up there, whether it's in the morning, at night, to get the shot. I said, listen, we spent a lot of money to come to Italy. Let's get a good shot. If we got to start it at 12 midnight, let's take a nap and wake up and have some fun. And so let's, I'll show the setup here. Look at that. Have you, if you've ever been to Italy, you will never see the Spanish steps so empty like that. If you just Google it, you're going to see thousands of people sitting here all at once, right? But we had the whole place to decide. I'm using a constant light as the main and two flashes from behind and um, putting that in the background and getting my shot. Okay, uh, here's another famous shot here. This is Amalfi Coast, and this was a little bit challenging because I couldn't use any of, it was impossible to use any kind of lighting here. Uh, I couldn't really put anybody on, on this, the, uh, right here in the balcony because they'd be in the picture and I wanted this angle to see the Malfi Coast. And this was so high up, this was like 40 feet up in the ground. I, I, there was no, you can't put any lighting there. So when you're faced, here's the, here's the rule. When you're faced with super, super strong sun, right? And it's really bright and you see sharp shadows. You have to, you, it's imperative that you put the nose to the light because you need their, their faces lit. If they don't put the nose to light, you're gonna get a shadow like this on their face. You know how hard in Photoshop it is to take out? So if I wanted in Photoshop, imagine this, let's say that this is their faces and the nose wasn't towards the light. I have to take out this shadow right here and make it look natural in Photoshop to make that sh shot look good. That is 
a near impossibility. And that's what happens when you're shooting in super, super, super bright light. If you don't have that nose to the light, you're going to get a shadow on the face like this. Good luck getting that out in Photoshop. You might have the most awesome shot in the world, the great expression, they look beautiful, but then just to deal with Photoshop to get that out is impossibility. So this is really important, nose to the light in that situation. Uh, should, how are we doing on time? We're doing good? Um, yeah, okay. we'll go, yeah, we'll go a couple minutes. All right, all right, just, yeah, just let me get to no, know. I can keep going forever here. I don't know how many photos <laughs> I got left. I think we're getting to the, I think we're getting near the end, but uh, here again, you only got, okay, so here's your situation. You're at the Louvre, okay? There's hundreds of people walking by. I just happened to spot a time where, oh my gosh, nobody, it's like one in a million chance, right? Nobody's walking by here. What am I gonna do? I got literally 30 seconds to put up a shot right now. You gotta think, you gotta pose it, you gotta put it up. And plus you don't know if the security guards are gonna like pull you down for your subject or whatever and start running after you because I got cameras all over the place there. So what I do, like get it up. I got this natural light coming in here, nose to the light. Boom, got the natural light. I got a what? Highlight and shadow, highlight and shadow. I'm putting the body away from there so I can get some highlight and shadow on her clothing. I set this up in 30 seconds, boom, done set down i mean and a lot of these photos that you see that are iconic a lot of the times i'm just shooting it and i only got a minute or two to get the shot off and so when you're in a press pressure situation you have to count on your fundamentals the fundamentals of lighting the fundamentals of posing the fundamentals of composition because once you master those fundamentals you can start to set up one minute shots that are absolutely breathtaking because you're not really doing anything complicated. You're just following your fundamentals. And that gives you so, when you follow your fundamentals and you're not using a lot of brain power, that extra brain power goes into creativity. So that's how you get a great shot. But if your whole mind on is like, how am I going to pose this person? There's no creative force coming out of your brain right now. And you're struggling. So you master the fundamentals. You spend hours and thousands and thousands of hours on that. You get into a situation like this where you go, oh, my gosh, this is my, this is my one in a million chance. What are you going to do with it? You can rely on your fundamentals to get a shot and to land it. And that's how you become a world-class photographer. Right? That's how you get paid money. Scott, we had a question come in on this one and then one in general. Um, first, yeah. what lens this was shot with? This, this is my 16 to, actually, it's probably going to be wrong because I remember shooting with <laughs> an A7. And so an A7, and I used a 16 to 35 lens here. Actually, it was a 17 to 35 lens. It was an old Tokina lens that I converted to use on my uh, A7 because the A7 at that time didn't have a lot of lens selection like it has now. When the first mirrorless came out, you're hunting for lens. So I was taking old lenses and just converting them and using them because I couldn't find them now. So this is a wide angle lens. And as far as um, when you have assistance getting close with lighting, do you bracket shots? So will you take a, you know, are you having them get so close? Generally, I don't shot? do that. Okay. Generally, I don't do that. So you're framing I, it with, you're framing it with your assistant out of the shot. And so that's why you'll see a, uh, some shots where they're next to the frame, but they're looking out of the frame and they're real close because the light, the lighting is right there. Right. And I'm cutting them out. And so I do that a lot. Okay. Uh, so I don't really care about that rule. I'm a rule breaker. <laughs> Good questions. Okay. Uh, here's, uh, here we are in Jamaica. And uh, what you don't know about this is that there's thousands of sand fleas biting our legs right now. And those fleas were so intense that you would, uh, they would show the flea bites would show up a week later and, and re it's like they, it's like coronavirus coming back again. But <laughs> you're like, what the heck? I thought I was through this. And they're like, what are these bumps on my leg? And it's like, they're so strong that they showed up a week later. But anyways, uh, great shot. 
Um, I'm just using a little bit of flash to fill them in, but I didn't want to destroy the ambiance of the shot. So I set my background first, add a little bit of flash there, uh, and learning to balance your flash with the ambient light to create a good shot. Okay, um, this is a very classic shot of mine, um, a classic pose um, and uh, composition, everything, right? I talk about the Scott spot and finding a, a shape, putting your subject dead in the middle there. I'm just having her do my classic pose that I learned, you know, in 2005 uh, and just doing something very basic, body away, nose towards the light. I got two flashes through an umbrella on full, boom, bam, one shot, it's done right and uh so and this kind of i like this shot because you don't have to shoot always shallow depth of field i know that's the end thing but you should try to use all your f-stops like for me it's like you know what people should be not shooting shallow and try to shoot with detail in your photos because it looks so different than everything else right now and so if you want to make a name for yourself do something different than everybody else is doing and so i like to show this shot because way one it's a portrait but it's wide angle and two it's like at f16 right like i took a portrait with f16 ah wait i've never done that before i never set by stop below uh i mean over f2 you know so try to use all your f stops okay another uh shot that i loved uh, this is in paris again this is again one of those moments where there's nobody walking it's like oh my gosh there's nobody walking here i gotta get a shot Right, I guess you could take it a bunch of times and do compositing and all like that, but that's too much work for me. I feel like, you know what, I'm just gonna find the shot that the world gives me. And so I've just kind of like honed my skills. It's like, okay, whatever the world gives me, I'm gonna get a great shot from whatever it dishes. This time it's all empty. And so what am I doing? Just doing my basics, nose to the light, body away, using my leading lines, setting my exposure for the background. And just one of these shots that I really, it's one of my favorite shots, I guess. It's just because I love the composition of it. Everything just seems to fit the, together, the timing fit. The model fit and it's just uh, I just like it and it's just all natural light um, this is another shot I loved because this uh, this <laughs> if you saw the back I tried to get the background shot of this but it's just in a hotel room and this was literally this pattern on the wall so we're in the hotel lobby or, or a subset a hallway of the lobby right and I'm teaching this class and they've got a chair there they've got this wall and, and then they have this like vase on this table that was like metal with all these bunch of holes in it. So I took the vase down, I put a, a flash with a red gel, fired it through to give me this pattern on the wall, right? I took a little um, video light to light her up and just one flash on 164th power to give me this little highlight here. And it totally looks like a studio shot but it's just in some hotel lobby with people constantly walking by <laughs> at all times. Uh, so this kind of shot taught me, it's like, man, you can make anywhere look great if you just know your, your lighting principles. Okay, um, here's another shot, wedding day. Uh, and I just love this little shot that she wanted to do. It didn't look great because she was in the shade. And so here's a tip with wedding photography. Backlight, 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 backlight equals romance, backlight equals love, okay? Just backlight the heck out of your weddings, right? So there was no backlight there, so I just took a flash. I put it behind her to shine that light in so um, I could get that expression on her face there. So uh, what was my determining factor on the strength of it is I wanted to light her up. I don't care if I blew out this veil, I just wanted her, that was my key. I set my background, right? Cause I wanted to see these trees and all this kind of stuff. And then that light I made strong enough so I could see her. And so I thought that was the photo right there, okay? Okay, uh, Paris again, using video light, you set your background first um, and then just add light in using a wide angle lens, 
I'm using my 16 to 35 here at probably around F4 because uh, I don't have the 2.8 and so I put it at F4. And another shot here, again, I've, I set my background first. She's in shade, I'm using a video light through an umbrella. Look at that, okay, here's how you get soft light. You use a large source, right? A source is bigger and closer. This is what you're looking for, folks. This is professional. See the transition between the highlight and the shadow? It's gradual. If you use hard light, it's going to be very distinct. But the softer your light, the more gradual the, the transition and the more beautiful that, okay, now here's a key. When you do skin smoothing on on, on skin that has highlight on shadow on it, it looks absolutely beautiful. But you need that highlight and shadow. You highlight and shadow the, your lighting and then you smooth the skin out, it just looks gorgeous, right? It's just something that looks great. Here's a reflection I shot that I did. And the key to doing a reflection shot is that they'll see the water that that's in, it has to be dark underneath, right? Do I have, so the key is, right? Put subject in good light, look for a reflective surface, the darker the better. Because that was the ground, you could see them. If that underneath, if this water was in like a clear pool with a white bottom, you would not see the reflection. So you could even make up your own reflections. You could take something dark like the uh, people do that. Put the screen, see how dark that screen is? You could put water on there, use that as, put that right up to your camera and you can use it as a reflection because it's dark. That's the key. It's gotta be dark, right? And then use water. Um, this is in Hawaii there. Again, setting your background. Uh, it's starting to rain here, but this is literally one video light through an umbrella. That's it, okay? Learn how to shoot portraits, wide angle shots, and real tight shots. I know it's real easy just to go in real close and create tight shots, but learn how to do wide shots because that way, if you do shots like that, you are improving and practicing your composition. Because when you go wide, it forces you to have more elements in your photo and, and then you have to deal with them. If I shot a portrait and I shot it really tight and I just shot her like this, yeah, it looked beautiful because she looks beautiful, but I don't have to worry about any other objects, especially if I just blur it out. I never have to learn composition. So force yourself to one, shoot portrait and to shoot landscape and to shoot it with a wide angle lens. So again, if you don't have a wide angle lens, go to the B&H website, put one in your cart and order one, okay? Use a wide angle lens, gotta do it. Try with both. Uh, another shot that was famous, right? And what made this interesting was um, this backlight that's behind her. And so she's actually in one of the, we're, we're shooting in this completely vintage antique mall which is like 10,000 square feet it is huge right and we got to know some of the people there so they gave us access to shoot there so there was this trailer behind her that she was sitting on I think she was sitting on the uh, doorway there and I said you know I got to make this interesting so there was a window in that trailer so I just took my flash with the orange gel and I just fired it behind her to give me that orange light behind her and so you can see here the main light was an, a flash with an, let's see, I think it's, yeah. So you can see the flat, you can see me, I'm right here. I'm right there, okay? And so this is my main light, which is a big flash and an umbrella was the catch light. So I'm right there in the middle, okay? All right, good. Um, this shot was taken outdoors. It looks like in the studio, but you don't realize this, and I wish I could find the, the uh, BTS video of it. Okay, these little lights, you couldn't actually see them colored when we took it because they were so small, and they were literally about 300 feet away from her background. But what I did was, 
took a long, an 85 millimeter lens and got it close to my subject as I could, and it would bring and create these huge bokeh balls that were, by, the, by your naked eye, you could not see these colored lights. You could, not, you could kind of see that they were there, but you could not see them. But through the magic of photography and the bokeh, you, I magnified these darn things up by using an 85 millimeter lens at 1.8, getting it super close to my subject. And even though this was like 300 feet away across the street, they become huge. And so, and then this was, she was just lit with a, a video light. Now, in order for her to be positioned so we could get these lights, she was literally standing on like a, a bent, like a picnic bench, something like that. So she was like way high up there. So even though it looks like I'm taking an up angle, well, I'm short too, my hand was raised all the way as high as I could. Good thing I have the flip screen on my Sony camera so I could look down and compose it. But my hand, I was reaching way up there to try to match the same height to get it. Uh, another shot that I really, really love, um, and this was, kind of cheating this was at the sony condo event i don't know if you guys know about that but sony has this event where they bring all the artisans and we just have a great time they spend millions of dollars on it that they just treat us first class it's like some it's like your favorite time of the week right because they spend all this money on you everything is free food is free but and then they get their studios because sony pictures is huge right they get these people to make these elaborate sets for us and they had this one with the video light going through them some blinds and then they'd have these beautiful models and they just say here go ahead shoot do whatever you want and this was great because there's about four of us photographers in there just having fun and we're all like having our ideas and this is one shot where it's a compilation about three or four of us putting the ideas together to create this shot and so this just reminds me of a great time with my other Sony fellow artisans and coming together to make a really good shot. And <laughs> so one of these times, so like when I went to Condo One, they built these amazing sets. I go, ooh, this would be great for a workshop. Let me ask and see, you know, would it be if I could hire these guys to do a workshop, we could set up stuff like this. So I go in there. And I go, hey, you know, how much does it cost for you guys to come and set up some lighting for us and whatever? And, you know, there's no movie stars or anything like this, just regular people. Oh, well, uh, if we came, maybe the lowest that we could do would be about $100,000. <laughs> I'm like, okay, I guess we're not doing that. So anyways, when they build this out and they do this stuff for us, I mean, just know that it's costing them Sony a lot of money to do this for us. Okay, um, another silhouette shot that I love because it's different. Because the bright light on a silhouette is usually like this, the sun, right? But this shot is different because I'm using the plume of the water to create the bright light. And so that's why I'm using like a 400 millimeter lens here. Um, and just, I, I, that's the most different silhouette that I've ever taken. And I thought that was pretty cool. So Scott, we'll go, Good. How one, we doing more, on time? We'll go one more picture and then we, we had a couple questions on gear. Sure. So we'll talk about this picture and then we had people asking about wide angle lens you recommend, camera body and video lights. Right. Okay. So let's just go to Italy for this last picture. This is one of my favorite pictures in Italy. And um, again, I've just got two flashes on full power through an umbrella, nose to the light, right? And I just want to ch choose a different angle instead of, you know, the subject facing you all the time. I, I decided to, as if she was kind of looking out in the canals of Venice, but I had her turn her your face to the side and I just see that I'm trying to go for that highlight shadow there. And it's just my basic principles again. And it's not even at F 1.8, right? And it's just, but the reason why this works, even though this is all detail here is that my subject's brighter than my background. So it sticks out. Okay. Questions. Perfect. So we had, I guess we'll finish on a gear note. 
Sure. Um, we had somebody ask about uh, the Sony, uh, the A7R4. So what are, what camera yes. what camera gear are you using? You know, asking they were asking in particular to megapixel. Camera. I think they got the A7R4 on sale for some ridiculous price. Like, wasn't it on sale now? I don't know, but it's a lot lower than it used. I think it's a twenty four hundred. No, that could be wrong. Whatever. I used the A7R3. Um, I used the A7R4, and I've got to say that. For some reason, I think the A7R4, the color profile looks a lot like the A9, okay? And so I think the color and the rendition of how it looks, especially if you're doing portraits, I don't know what it is. It looks a little better. I don't know. but And it's 60 megapixels, of course. Um, and so that's the difference I find between the A7 III and the A7 IV. The color tone and the way it looks and feels is a little bit more like the A9. So I don't know if you ever used an A9 before. It seems like they kind of just upgraded the color with it a bit more, and it gives you that crazy 61 megapixels um, if you're a, you know, pixel counter or something like that it's great i don't you know i don't really the reason why i didn't go up because i for me 42 megapixels is enough for me and i'm and i'm fine with it and i do a lot of post processing where i get the color where i want it anyways and so i just didn't feel like even though it's a great camera it's like well i just got these a7r3s you know i didn't feel like i needed to but if you're in the market those are the differences and Probably if I were if I didn't have any cameras and I were just going to buy it, I'd probably go with the A7R4. Okay. And now we had a question about wide angle lenses. Is there a wide angle lens you recommend for the Sony system? Or oh it? man, I am in love with the 24 millimeter Prime. I don't wonder if I've got yeah. Here here it is, 24 millimeter Prime. I like it because it can do this, and then it can do this. That's the same lens. <laughs> that is the same lens, folks. So look at the versatility on that. You got that, and then you got that with the same freaking lens. Well, a lot of a lot of people don't think wide angle for portraits. I've been shooting wide portraits for years, and I don't know why everyone goes right to eighty-five to one thirty-five. Yeah, because that's what the Instagrammers do. There you go. Now, <laughs> now, go opposite <laughs> for the video lights. We had somebody asking which video lights you use. Um, I use the light and motion lights. I love them because they're really super high quality. You can get them anywhere from 1,000 lumens to 10,000 lumens. And uh, the 1,000 and the 2,000 are completely waterproof. So um, I don't know if I have a photo that was in there that did that. And so I sometimes I put the lights underneath the water to give me some uplight. And it's so cool. Uh, so you can take them in the pool with you in the ocean. And like, I love those lights. Awesome. Well, Scott, thank you again. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. We, we always love having Scott back. It's always a ton of information in a very fun way with some of the greatest images out there. Uh, so thank you again. A huge thank you to our sponsor, uh, Sony, for this. So, Sony, Scott, thanks you. So, uh, Scott, Sony, Thank thanks you. you. B&H, we, we always love uh, dealing with uh, our Sony artisans of imagery. Um, for everybody who's tuning in on Facebook, thank you for watching. For those of you participating on Zoom, thank you as well. And we will see you guys next time on another rendition of the B&H Virtual Event Space.